Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. Would everyone please stand for opening prayer? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for another beautiful day. And Lord, no matter what, it's a wonderful day with you, and we thank you for that. We pray this morning that our hearts are open as we begin our study in 1 Peter, Lord, the lessons you have for us. It's a challenge to live out our faith and uh, help us to understand these things and to grow in our walk with you. And we always pray, Lord, as we worship you, may it be out of love. May we not just sing these songs, but Lord, may our hearts and minds be focused upon you, giving you all the honor and glory and praise. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if we could open up our Bibles this morning, please, to Psalm 54, where we are told, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Before God is my helper, the Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Amen. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter as we begin our in-depth study of 1 Peter. And, you know, again, there's so much on prophecy today, and I think prophecy is so important. Important. I don't think you can read the Bible without dealing with prophecy in almost every single book. There may be one book that doesn't deal with a lot of prophecy, but that is, I think that's it. Um, but also, and this is really important for us to understand, is in the days we're living in, how are we to live out our faith? Because that's what people are watching. And I see, you know, again, I, I like looking on Facebook because it kind of gives me a general idea of what people are feeling. It's crazy. Yeah. But for us, when we're going to deal with 1 Peter, he's going to talk about the persecution we face, that we're to be a holy people, that we're to love one another, that we're to grow in the Lord as we take in his word that we're to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against our soul, that we're to submit to those in authority over us. That'll be a big message. I'm sure you'll be checking that one out so you know when I'm doing that one. Um, that we're to submit ourselves at work, or in our marriage, how we're to conduct ourselves as suffering comes our way, and we look at the example of Jesus in suffering, how he handled it how pastors are to shepherd the flock that God has entrusted to them, that we are to humble, humble ourselves, and a whole lot more. This is how we are to live in a world that is at war with God and his people, you and me. And I see that intensity growing in the days we're living in, because I think Satan knows his days are short, that his time is not going to be forever, and he's ramping things up. And look at the atrocities that are going on in the world today. In fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, who we are. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. I think that the Holy Spirit has guided us into our study here of 1 Peter and then eventually 2 Peter because I think that it's important to hear and apply these things to our lives. One of the things, and I'll just tell you my struggle because, you know, I'm dealing with a family member on Facebook, is, man, he knows how to push my buttons. 
And I think that's the only reason he does it. I think he's really trying to – and I, I finally – you know, you get to the point where you go, enough is enough. There's no point because you're really not listening, so why continue on? So I don't even respond anymore because it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. But it's, Lord, help us, help me to live in a way that would draw people to you. And that's what Peter's going to do. He's going to show us how to walk now that we've come to saving faith. And I think also to give us hope, comfort, Instructions how we're to live out our faith. And especially in these difficult times we're living in. And Warren Worsby put it like this. He said, while there's life, there's hope. The ancient Roman saying is still quoted today. And like most adages, it has an element of truth, but no guarantee of certainty. It's not the fact of life that determines hope, but the faith of life. A Christian believer has a living hope because his faith and hope are in God. This living hope is the major theme of Peter's first epistle. He's saying to all believers, be hopeful. I think that's important for us to understand. Where is our hope placed in, guys? Because it's really easy to place hope in certain people or groups or whatever, even Calvary chapels. No, your hope is in God. It's in Jesus Christ. It's not a church. It's not a government. It's not your job. It's not this. It's not that. It's in Jesus Christ. And if we don't understand that, if our hope is not in him, then, man, I'll tell you what, our light's not going to shine. And we'll end up mimicking the actions of this world, and this world has no hope apart from Christ. You know, several weeks back after the abomination of the opening ceremony at the Olympics in Paris, I posted on Facebook, how their portrayal of the Last Supper was a slam against Christ and Christians all over the world. I didn't say anything more than that, except that if they slammed Islam like they did Christianity, there would have been a holy war against France. Just a reality. And some of my family jumped on that and said all kinds of wild things, called me names. I I just kind of put what I believed. I didn't call anyone out except the officials that put on this abomination. And as the name calling went on, My last post was that when you don't have a point to make about what you believe, you end up calling people names. And that's what was going on. And it's interesting because this is what one of my relatives said. Joe Joe Guglielmo, love how you are completely missing my point to try and make yourself feel better, that your life choices bully, bully others, which is far from Christian. I believe that it is called gaslighting, which your Lord and Savior, Donald Trump, excels at. Personally, I always viewed the Last Supper as a big gay orgy, which is most definitely the best way to spend an evening before you're about to be nailed to a cross the next day. So you see, you can't scare me from your Facebook or your pulpit. I'm an equal opportunity offender and pro-sin flaunter. I am the most positive, I am almost positive that burning in hell would be a lot more fun than the pearly gates of heaven, but since they don't exist and we just become worm food, I'll take sin any day and every day. Because at the end of the day, the word sin was written in an outdated book by a bunch of people wanting to control others. Now, I told you what I wrote, right? Did it have anything to do with what she said? Absolutely nothing. You know, I wasn't bullying her. I didn't pick her out of the crowd. Why did she feel this way? Why was she responding this way? Conviction. She feels the conviction of God, and she's fighting against it. And so I didn't really respond because there's no point. You know, God's doing his work. (laughs) Stay away. Let him handle it. And my prayer is that eventually she would come to her senses and she would see how much God loves her. That's the whole point. But I find it interesting how angry people are when they feel the conviction of God. And we've probably all been there. You know, Peter... And 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 17 said, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. 
But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as, an evil, as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. We're in a battle. I, I just saw a Facebook post that was a pastor who was being arrested. He was at a school board meeting and he was kind of calling the school board out and they arrested him. And this was the nicest guy in the world. I mean, he's in handcuffs, he's answering their questions, he's going, you know, maybe the school board should be arrested for not helping these children out. What a representation of Christ. He wasn't swearing, angry, fighting back. He was representing Christ. And we have to remember that. We don't fight with physical weapons. Our weapons are spiritual, and we need to be ready, we need to prepare to give a defense to everyone ask, who asks us for the reason of the hope that's in us. And it's really not about what people say or do to us, it's about them and their relationship with the Lord. They need to come to saving grace. For us, I don't care what happens to us, this is the worst it's ever going to get for us. Because when we go home to be with the Lord, oh my gosh, we have an eternity with our Lord and Savior. Amen. So we may suffer, and we will, but let's suffer for doing good, not evil. You know, we, sometimes we get persecuted for being obnoxious. That's not a good thing to be persecuted <laughs> for, okay? For righteousness sake, great. For obnoxious sake, no. And Here's the thing. Are we allowing God to work in us? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is in us, and it should cause us to shout for joy. You know, all, I think everyone here goes, man, it looks like the Lord's return is getting closer. Well, why aren't we smiling? Why aren't we, like, excited? You don't know what the government's going to do. You don't know, what the, you know who's the elections and all the... No, I don't know. He does, and... The Lord's coming back, and whatever, if he comes back in my lifetime, praise the Lord. If he doesn't, praise the Lord, because we are his witnesses in this world. Yeah, God could have done it himself and would have done a far better job, but he's using us as his witnesses in this dark world. And, you know, we just finished up the, uh, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. What was the theme of the letter? Joy. Yeah, that's what we need to have. Not easy. Not easy in this world. And so as we embark in this adventure on First Peter, I pray that it gives us hope in the days that we're living in. And here's the thing, you know, about Peter, because there are those who believe that Peter was uh, the first pope. Um, no, he wasn't even the head of the church in Rome. Uh, we never see Peter mention himself as the apostle to the Gentiles, in fact. That's interesting. Yet Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian regiment, was a Gentile, and God called Peter to witness to him, his family, and friends, and they got saved in Acts chapter 10. But the door to the Gentiles was opened through Peter, but that was until Paul the Apostle came on the scene, and Paul became the Apostle to the Gentiles. I'll show you what I mean. Romans 11, verses 13 through 15. Paul said, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being, for their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Make no mistake, Paul loved his Jewish brethren. In fact, when he, every time he went into his city, he would speak to the Jews first, and they usually cast him out, you know, threw him out of the, the synagogue. So he loved them, but his main ministry was to the Gentiles. In fact, as you read the book of Acts, there's not a whole lot more written about Peter. Not that he wasn't serving the Lord, but the focus is on Gentiles getting saved. In fact, Galatians 2.7, Paul said, But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised has been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. What does that mean? Well, Peter, or Paul's saying is the gospel 
to the Gentiles uncircumcised has been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised or the Jews was committed to Peter. So how could he be, Peter, be the Pope and the head of the Gentile church when his ministry was really to the Jews? And I know that's shocking to some, probably not none of you, but keep in mind, the church in Rome probably got started by a group of Jewish Christians who came there from Judea. Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, this is what we're told. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were there for Pentecost, and they saw all these mighty things of God, and I'm sure they heard Peter's powerful message, and these people got saved. And some may have remained in Jerusalem for a time learning about the Lord, but eventually they had to go back home. And we to we're told that there were there those from Rome. And what did they do? They brought the gospel message there in Rome. You know, Peter, I don't think he was ever in Rome until he was arrested for preaching the gospel and was there to face trial and then his execution by the Roman government. And for Peter, you look at his life, you go, here's a guy who believed Jesus Christ was Almighty God, he believed in the miracles of God, and he believed in the resurrection. How do I know that? Because he was willing to die for his faith. He didn't live in some ivory tower looking down at the common people. He was right there with them. In fact, he suffered for his faith. He understood what it was all about, and now he's encouraging others. And so this letter that Peter wrote was probably to a group of Christians who were being persecuted for their faith. Uh, there was probably Jews as well. But that persecution was going to grow and grow under Caesar Nero. And, you know, first of all, we see an exhortation that he wants us to have a steadfast endurance during this time, to live a life of commendable behavior in, sp in spite of what we're facing. That's important. Steadfast endurance. Commendable behavior. Yeah. And persecution. I think we're, most Christians in America don't understand what per, real persecution is about. Other parts of the world, they see it. Many have given their lives for their faith in Christ. But I think that's coming. Do you really think, you know, we, we see, you know, people put in Facebook jail, you know, where they can't post for a while because of some of the things they posted, right? That's a big, ooh, I'm being persecuted. But that freedom of speech that we have is going away. You know, look at what they did in California. You know, you, there's some things you can't post on Facebook because the governor said it's against the law. Wow, really? So... This book in Canada is considered a, the Bible, hate book, because it comes against sin. They don't put it that way. And that's coming here. So parts of the Bible, they're going to say, you can't teach on that. You know, I send my letters to a lot of guys in prison. Maybe I will have a, a real prison ministry while I'll actually be in there. I don't know. But do you think I'm going to stop preaching from God's word to appease a group of people that want to live in sin? No, not at all. Persecution's coming and it's going to grow. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Yeah. You know, ever since the church got started on the day of Pentecost, it's been persecuted. And 
Then it was by the Jews or local communities, and then Rome came in, coming down against them. And Rome came down, it, they were brutal against Christians. You know, Paul, remember he was in Rome in his first imprisonment because he appealed to Caesar. He was two years in Caesarea Philippi. Things weren't going anywhere. Um, he was under arrest there. And finally he said, enough. I, I appeal to Caesar. I want my case before Caesar. And he's there two years under house arrest, chained to Roman soldiers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then he appears before Caesar Nero. And do you think Paul just watered things down when he spoke with Nero? Not at all, man. Paul just laid it out, man. Here are the facts. Here's the information, Nero. Jesus Christ is Almighty God. He loves you. He died for your sins. You need to repent to get right. And I think for Nero, the truth was right there before him. It's not like he could deny it. But he fought against it so hard. And he rejected the truth. And for Paul, since he committed no crime at that time, he's released for a time around 62 AD. And many believe that's when Peter arrived in Rome sometime in AD 62, a year or so after Paul was released from his first imprisonment. And Caesar Nero, man, to say he, he was a pretty good guy to start with is wrong. He was never a good guy. He was a wicked guy. But after Paul witnessed to him, something changed in him. It's almost like he was demon-possessed because the things that he did were, you just can't imagine. I mean, he was a madman as he persecuted Christians. On July 19, 64 AD, he had his men burn some of the old buildings in Rome. Um, he wanted the fire to uh, destroy some of the old buildings so he could rebuild. And it got out of control. It burned for six days and six nights. And... You know, rumors got started that Nero did this. Well, Nero didn't want to get blamed for burning Rome. That's not a good thing. So he blamed the Christians for burning Rome. Perfect scapegoat. Um, one writer, uh, Tacius, uh, wrote, But all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the fire was the result of an order by Nero. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most tortures on a class hated for the abominations called Christians by the populace. So Peter is there in, in Rome around 62 AD, and that would place the writing of 1 Peter um, and 2 Peter around 63, 64 AD. Peter was put to death uh, shortly after that, around 64, sometime in 64 AD. And things are now heating up. Christians are being persecuted. Nero was burning Christians at the stake. He would put them in animal skins and let the lions come after them and tear them to pieces. He would stick them on, on poles and, and pour um, uh, oil on them and light them on fire, and he would ride down the road in his chariot naked. That's not normal. I hope it's not. That was him. And Nero died in 68 AD, so that would mean both Peter and Paul had to be put to death before that time. Uh, Nero probably murdered Peter, like I said, in 64 AD. Um, and for Peter, you know, he, he, couldn't, he was going to be crucified, right? And he couldn't die the same way his Lord did, and so he said, was crucified upside down. Now, that's not in the Bible necessarily. It's historical information. But can you imagine? Crucifixion itself is horrible, but upside down? I think Jesus touched on that in John 21, verses 18 and 19. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Well, I think that's kind of speaking of him being crucified. So Peter's there. Paul is also rearrested, and Nero had him beheaded around 66 AD. And so 
the end of Peter's life, yes, he was in Rome, but he didn't start the church there. He wasn't there when Paul wrote Romans from uh, Corinth. Uh, he doesn't mention Peter's name at all. And so I, don't, I, I do believe Peter wrote this letter from Rome. Some believe it was from Babylon. Uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 5.13, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Again, some see this as Babylon, but again, if this is written when Peter's going to be shortly arrested and put to death, I don't think he's going to be that far away in Babylon. I think he's in Rome. Um, but again, why Rome and say Babylon? Well, uh, Peter didn't want to use Rome because there's already persecution. So um, he speaks of Rome as being Babylon, a, a cryptic name for Rome, which was wicked and more and full of idolatry, uh, kind of like Jerusalem being um, Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, we see that in the Bible. It just doesn't mean it is. It's just that the activities were like that. And Peter, again, it, it's amazing what Peter, the pe people will write their uh, um papers on who wrote First Peter. I'm a simpleton, okay? I, I really am. I, I, I don't make things complicated. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I know. I don't even know Greek and I could figure that one out, right? And so could you. The, the church never doubted who wrote this letter. They knew it was Peter. Uh, Ignatius taught that Peter wrote this, uh, second century Polycarp, Justin Martyr, uh, Irenaeus, Tertullian in the third century, and Clement, um, and from the fourth century by Eusebius of Caesarea, he said, as to the writings of Peter, one of his epistles called the first is acknowledged as genuine, for this was anciently used by the ancient fathers in their writings as an undoubted work of the apostle. So I don't know, you know, it, it seems pretty simple to me, uh, but again, people like to f write papers on stuff that make no sense. Uh, I just, I'm a simpleton. Others say, well, the Greek language here is too complicated for a Galilean fisherman. Well, that, I mean, think about that. That's like saying, well, they couldn't read or write because he's a good old country boy. Really? Just because they live in the country, they're a country boy, they can't read or write? What are you trying to say? Uh, there's no reason to, to doubt that. And also, remember, Peter is inspired by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 4.13, two fishermen, Peter and John, appear before the Sanhedrin for their faith in Christ. This is the Jewish religious council, very wicked group of people. And it says, now when they saw the boldness in Peter, of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Now, the Living Bible says, when the council saw the boldness of Peter and John and could see that they were obviously uneducated non-professionals, they were amazed and realized what being with Jesus had done for them. In other words, they're saying, you know, these guys are country boys. How could they write like this? How could they talk like this? How could they know these things? Oh, how? They were with Jesus. I don't care what kind of education you have. I don't care how smart or unsmart you think you are. You spend time with Jesus and God will give you what you need to do. There is no doubt. Notice I have no diplomas back here anywhere because I don't have a diploma for theology. I never went to school. I tried. Lord shut the door on that because he wanted to teach me. Um, if you went back and looked at my high school records, I've told you before, I helped the bell curve, okay? I, I would be considered untrained and uneducated. But when you spend time with Jesus, it's amazing what the Lord will show you and how he opens up the scriptures to you. And that's the most important thing. And that's what was happening with Peter and John. Also in 2 Peter 3.1, we're told, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, and both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So if in 2 Peter, Peter says, I'm writing to you this second epistle, what does that imply? Oh, that there's a first epistle, right? Oh, that's what we have right here, a first epistle. Again, 
very simple. But again, and it, again, how much studying do you need to figure that out? I mean, it's really, to me, it's kind of simple, very plain. Um, and again, in the church today, there's a lot of worry and anxiousness about all that's going on. But, you know, the church is, again, like I said, it's no different than when the church got started. It was a wicked, man, talk about a wicked world. It was very wicked. Corinth was known for its wickedness and morality. And what happened? Oh, the gospel went there and people got saved and things changed. You know, and regarding the persecution, one writer put it like this. He said, throughout the nearly two millennia of its existence, the church of Jesus Christ has been no stranger to suffering. The clash of truth with error, of the kingdom of light with the kingdom of darkness, and the children of God with the children of the devil inevitably results in severe conflict. Opposition, reject, rejection, ostracism, scorn, contempt, persecution, even martyrdom have been the lot of believers through the centuries. That the evil world system vents its fury on the church should, not, should surprise no one, for that is how it treated the Lord Jesus Christ. Describing the persecution of his followers, his followers would experience, Jesus pointed out the, the truth. A disciple is not above his master, nor a slave above his master. It's enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebah, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Centuries before his birth, Isaiah predicted that Christ would be despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The Apostle John noted his rejection by the sinful world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Jesus plainly told the disciples that he was going to suffer and be killed. Matthew 16, 21 records that Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Unable to attack Jesus after his ascension, the enemies of the truth assaulted his followers. Yeah, it's very hard to fight against God, isn't it? So what do they do? They attack the believers. They try to extinguish the light. That's what's going on. We see it in Acts 4, verses 1 through 4. Now Saul was consenting to his death, death of Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Again, the church got started where? Jerusalem. It was made up of Jews. Now this persecution is coming. And all of a sudden, as the persecution comes, it's scattering believers all over the place. You know, you know how it is. You know, you're trying to put out a fire and you're going to stomp on it, right? What happens? Embers shoot out all over the place. And if there's dry grass or whatever around, all of a sudden that starts on fire. Well, that's what was happening with the church. These believers went out all over the place and people were getting saved. They're preaching the word everywhere they went. So what they tried to do in Jerusalem didn't help, but it, it's like Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. And that's what's going on here. Now, to kind of sum up this letter, here's what I, what I see here. Where there's Christ, there's hope. So when, no matter what you're going through, think about that. Where there's Christ, there's hope. Whatever situation you're facing, where there's Christ, there's hope. That's what Peter's going to be showing. It's important for us to understand that. And if he can't see us through life's most difficult situations, then we're in trouble. It's, are we willing to surrender to him as we're going through these? I don't always understand 
why this is happening. I don't always get it. You know, for the women's retreat, I had packed everything up. I had more stuff than I needed because just in case I forgot or didn't have enough, I had everything packed for the women's retreat. And I went up there and I set everything up and, you know, I was kind of looking at, thinking about the cords and that's a pretty three-pronged cord. How does it fit in the guitar? I, it, it, I was kind of concerned about that, but... You know, the musician wasn't there, the worship leader wasn't there, and I had everything set up, and I was pretty happy, and, you know, and then she came, and she took out her equipment and her guitar, we looked at the cables, I didn't bring the little box that you have to plug into so you can plug into the guitar. Well, I don't play an instrument, you got, don't say praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. So I didn't even think about that. I'm like, oh man, if I have to go back home, it's two hours home, two hours back, four hours. I'm going to get there. She's going to have to practice real quick and then uh, get ready for the study. And I'm like, uh. And then she thought, well, her husband, Tom, maybe he can go to Calvary Chapel Appleton, pick up a box, and then meet halfway. I thought, well, yeah, that would be better. And so that's what we did. Why did that happen? Because you're not smart, Joe. Besides that, okay? I don't know. I don't, I don't understand it. But I know God has a plan. It wasn't like I was like, I was upset with myself. But I wasn't like freaking out. What are we going to do? Just got to trust God. You know, one writer said, make no mistake about it. He will see us through life's most difficult situations. Yeah, life is difficult, and this is harsh truth, and it has not always been understood by those following Jesus Christ. Many Christians today have trouble sorting out the complexity of their identity and calling in Christ. They were reared to believe that a Christian should only experience the joys of being one of God's elect. They've been taught nothing of our exilic state. Absolutely. Have your best life now. Hey, you know, Life is tough. We're living in these physical bodies that are second law of thermodynamics. They're wearing down. You know, I went to the doctor because, you know, my, my, hand, my fingers are stiff. It's hard to close them. And we've got a lot of pain in my muscles. And she ran a bunch of tests and basically like, I don't know. All right, Lord. <laughs> Great. But whatever the case is, I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing. What, what am I going to do? I don't know why this is happening. I'm getting old. But why? What's the purpose? I don't know. I have to trust God. He goes on with these th three simple words in the opening of this letter. Peter gives us the biblical corrective, a profound clue for finding life's true horizon. We are the elect exiles of the dispersion. Throughout the scriptures, the way up comes by going down. Restoration comes after trials. It is the inversion and in attaining glory that marks Peter's theme throughout this letter. Christians' future inheritance and exaltation, our eternal uh, share in the glory of Christ, will be awarded to us on the day of his appearing. But that promised day only comes after this brief season of present-day sufferings. For suffering always precedes subsequent glories. As it was for God's Son, so it will be for all of us who are with him. This bringing together of two seemingly incompatible truths, our status in Christ and our sufferings on earth, is how Peter's letter begins. And in the body of the letter, three incompatible ideas are continually joined to one another. And again, you know, think about it. You know what David said, and I shared this with you before, but as we go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. I want you to understand, I don't care if it's in the Hebrew or, or whatever, it doesn't say, as I set up my home in the valley of the shadow of death. No, it says, I'm passing through this valley of the shadow of death. Where am I going? I'm going to the Mesa, where there's times of refreshing. So God brings us through these very difficult times, and we end up going to a place of rest and comfort until we go back into the valley of the shadow of death again. And that's where we grow. 
We don't grow on the mountaintop or on the mesa. We grow in these valleys. And those are difficult times. If everything was perfect in our life, how do we trust in the Lord? Think about it. Everything is perfect. I don't have to worry. But when difficulty comes, we cry out to God. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's the key. I've kind of broken this letter into three main points. The salvation of the believer, the suffering, a submission of the believer, and the suffering of the believer. And we'll deal with that as we go through it. I'm not going to give you the whole outline. Uh, it'll be on the web page with the notes. But we see three points, the holiness in our salvation and sanctification, harmony as we submit our lives in all walks of life to those in government, business, marriage, family, life, and so on. And lastly, humility as we humble ourselves as we suffer for Christ. That's important for us to understand. So this morning, we're just going to do an introduction. I know you, this, is my, this wasn't your introduction, Joe? No, we, we're, we're still getting there. Uh, but I've broken these verses down into two points, written to in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and then the Trinity in 1 Peter 1.2. And so that's kind of our basic introduction here of uh, 1 Peter. And let's pick up 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we study his word and just look at this glorious and encouraging truth where there's Christ, there's hope. Peter wrote this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, again, no confusion who wrote this letter. We're told it was Peter, very simple. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not only any Peter, but the apostle Peter. So, very clear. His name Peter means Petros, uh, a stone, uh, it was a name given to him by Jesus. His birth name was Simon, it means shifting sand, which is really interesting. And also he's called uh, Cephas, which is an Aramaic name, it means stone. So here's the thing, and I just need to touch on this, but some believe that Peter, again, was the head of the church in Rome, and thus the first pope, and they go to Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18 to prove their point. And they, they feel that, without a doubt, these verses show that Peter was the first pope. Well, what does that say? Well, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So because of what Jesus said here, that the church is going to be built upon the, this rock, the Roman Catholic Church believes that the church is built upon Peter, the first pope. Again, he's never called that. We never see that in the scriptures. And I think what the scriptures are teaching is that the church is built upon the proclamation made by Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church is built upon Jesus Christ. The fact that he's Almighty God, he's the one that builds the church. There's no man that could build a church. Think about it. You know, Jesus says, you know, I'm going to die, right? I'm going to be crucified. Third day, I'm going to rise again. What does Peter say? Not so, Lord. And what does Jesus say to the first pope? Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> That's the problem with man. He had this really awesome spiritual revelation from the Father. Yep, I did it. I'm sure he's looking at the other apostles going, you see what Jesus said, man? I'm number one. And then he has a non-revelation from God. Man is man. The best of men are the best of men, guys. If the church is built upon man, we're in serious trouble. 
The church has to be built upon the rock, Jesus Christ. Peter's name, Petros, is a small stone. The word that's used for rock is Petra, a massive stone. And so that's, this, this is what Jesus is saying here. The church is not built upon a small stone, a pebble. The church is built upon the rock, upon Jesus. And think about who Jesus is speaking to. His disciples, they're Jewish. All of them. And as you look through the scriptures, when the word rock is used in a figurative sense, it's never used of man. It's always speaking of God. And Jesus doesn't change that here. And I'm speaking of the Old Testament. That's important. And so what Jesus is saying is that God, upon God himself, upon Jesus, the Son of the living God, I'm going to build my church. Yeah. Peter, again, never spoke of himself as the foundation of the church, the rock that the church was built upon. In fact, in Acts 4, 11 and 12, this is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's it. He's speaking to Jesus. And we're told that the gates of hell, Hades, shall not prevail against it. In other words, no matter what Satan and his demons do, are they going to be able to overcome the church? No, it's going to stand no matter who comes against it. Think about it. Those that have tried to destroy the Bible, what's still here? The Bible. Where are those men that tried to destroy the Bible? Oh, they've died and are gone. God's church is going to stay. It's going to remain. We can rest in that. Doesn't mean it's not going to be persecuted. Doesn't mean it's not going to be attacked. Not at all. There, in Canada, churches are being targeted to burn down. I can't remember the numbers, but it's incredible how many churches have been burned in Canada. The attacks are there trying to destroy the faith of the people. We need to understand the gates of hell will not overcome this church. And yeah, I like Peter says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Why an apostle? Authority. I was one of the ones that was with Jesus. I heard him teach. I've seen the miracles that he did. I've seen all this. So I have the authority to speak forth these things because I was an eyewitness of all this. Now, in the broadest sense of the word, we're all apostles because we're basically ones sent forth. We're ambassadors. We're not part of the apostles, part of the 12. Not at all. Those were a select group of men. But we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. We're ambassadors of Christ. We're going out into the world proclaiming what? The good news of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. We're not doing our own thing. We're representing God and we're speaking forth his word. That's really important. And Peter is speaking to Gentiles, and I, I think also Jews here, because it's part of the dispersion, but both Gentiles and Jews were being dispersed. And, you know, these cities um, were located in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey that Peter's speaking of here, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Um, and this is where the gospel was being spread through the early years. And this was probably the route that this letter was distributed. You know, keep in mind, it wasn't written to any one congregation, but to all these Christians, and so it's probably spread th throughout all of them. And 
Peter says that they're pilgrims. What does that mean? Someone who is settled in a foreign land temporarily and is living alongside a group of people from which they don't belong. Does that sound familiar? That's us. We talked about it in Philippians. That's exactly what we do. We don't belong here. We have a new home, heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And I like that. In fact, Peter in 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Yeah, it's a battle. We're, we're not of this world, and yet the world wants to conform us into its image. And it's done a very good job. You look at the church today, and many of them are no different than the world. I, I see the worship, I see this, the skits that they do, and they're like you know, going to Las Vegas. It's not worshiping God. I'm sorry. We're not to be like this world, and we're fighting against that. In fact, Paul says we're a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yeah, we need to live that way. Well, as we read on, we're going to look at the Trinity. I know that's kind of interesting because many people will say, but there's no, the word Trinity is never found in the Bible. Well, let's look at verse 2. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. What Peter is doing in 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 12, is dealing with our salvation. That's what he's talking about. And again, people, people like to deny the Holy Trinity. I was just watching a video uh, from a group of people, um, oneness group, uh, that don't believe in the Trinity. I'm like, well, how do you get around that? So we'll kind of look at this. But he, he starts out with our election or how God the Father chose us out of his grace for the kingdom according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And in the Greek, it speaks of that word foreknowledge, knowledge known in advance. Well, yeah, that just makes sense, doesn't it? Does God know everything? Absolutely. He knows the beginning from the end. That's why we have... We know what's coming because he's already told us. Now, again, there are those that believe that God's predestined some for heaven, some for hell, and there's no choice. But we don't see that in the scriptures. If This is not a shotgun wedding, you know, where you're, I'm sorry, God's saving you and there's nothing you can do about it. No. We have, the thing is, we have choices. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites and those in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. That's a choice, very clear. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. Is, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What's God's desire? That all would be saved. But it doesn't mean all will. Why? Because they have a free will. <laughs> they have a choice to make. Everyone has a choice. Adam and Eve had a choice in the garden to make. They could obey God or disobey God. They could eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or they could reject that. And they disobey God. Why? Because it was their choice. Did God know what they were going to do? Oh, absolutely. Why? Because we're told that Jesus is the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. So before even God created us, he knew what we goofballs would do, right? He knew what we would do, and he was willing to create us and then die for us so we could be redeemed from our sin. <coughs> Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. An invitation. This gospel message is an invitation. Islam, you are forced to receive or you die. Right? This is an invitation. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle 
and lonely in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and your burden is light. Who's the call to? All who labor and are heavy burden. We were all there before we got saved, right? And even after we're saved, we still call upon him, Lord, I'm overwhelmed. Give me the peace, the rest that I need. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together. Let's talk about this. Let's think about this. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Imitation. And, of course, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The word world is speaking of everyone. And if we still doubt that, then it says that whoever believes in him. It's a choice. You have a choice to make to receive him. I like that about our God. It's always an invitation. Well, we not only see this from the God the Father, but then we see the sanctification of the Spirit. God is working in our lives to perfect us. The moment we get saved, we come to a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're justified. But then that moment we get saved, the sanctification process now begins where God is working in us, cleansing us from that garbage that's still there because we're still in these bodies of flesh. Second uh, Thessalonians 2, verses 13 and 14. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sanctification of the Spirit. That's what Peter's talking about here. You know, many don't even believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity, that he's real. How are you living out your Christian faith? By your power, your strength? Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. We can try. Oh, man, that guy's making me so mad. I'm counting to 10. One, two, three. You know, I better go to 20, maybe 30 with this guy because he's, no, Lord, work on my heart, soften my heart because that's where the issue is. We need the Holy Spirit. In fact, 1 John 3, 5, we're told, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there's no sin. What is that? Well, that's the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the third point. Last part of Revelation 1, 5, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Isn't that amazing? How many sins are in your life when God the Father looks upon you once you're saved. None. In a positional sense. Now practically, sorry, we still blow it. We're still dealing with it. But the blood of Christ cleanses us from what? Part of our sin? All our sins. Praise God for that. The Holy Trinity is actively involved in our lives, guys. Is the word Trinity found in the scriptures? No. But we see the point being made. One God manifested in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the one I'll give you, uh, Matthew 3, 16 and 17, as Jesus is being baptized in the Jordan River. We're told when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Yeah, okay, the word Trinity is not there, but the picture is there. The word Bible is not here in the Bible. Did you know that? You don't, you don't ever find it. What about omniscience or God's all-knowing, omnipotence, God's all-powerful, omnipresence, God's present everywhere? You won't find those words in there, but the concept you will. So do you need those specific words? No, I, I don't. I, I see it very clearly. And then Peter says, grace to you and peace be multiplied to you. Just like Paul, Peter speaks of these Siamese twins of the New Testament, grace and peace. And you're never going to experience the peace of God until you make peace 
with God through Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. The work's finished by Jesus. And I love that. Kenneth West wrote, We have therefore the three steps taken by the three persons of the triune God. God the Father chooses the sinner to salvation. God the Spirit brings the sinner thus chosen to the act of faith. And God the Son cleanses him in his precious blood. Yeah. God saves us, sustains us. We're not going to be lost. I don't think you could lose your salvation. I realize that's a hot topic. So I'll save that for next week. (laughs) As we're looking at our security in Christ as we continue on here in our study of 1 Peter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have you love us so much you have given us your word that we may grow in our walk with you and lord it's not always easy but lord we know that you are you love us and you're patient and that you will see us through these things and i pray for anyone here that may be overwhelmed this morning just worried anxious lord may your peace comfort them a peace that surpasses all understanding And Lord, help us to know where there's Christ, there's always hope. In Jesus' name, amen.